We've got a really important evening uh, for you, planned out for you this evening. Uh, one of the key features of this is going to be going to be able to talk to your community members about what the future of STEM by CAP looks like. And I think that's going to be a, an important part of our conversation to think about moving forward. I'd like to um, want to introduce our wonderful superintendent uh, and also offer for you a little bit of expectation setting this evening. A lot of what we have been talking about up until this point have been a lot of questions and a lot of really important questions from our community members about what's going to happen to Washington Middle School. And a lot of those questions are floating out here. We've got a lot of really great resources in the building this evening who are open to having conversations. But for our program tonight, we want to talk about what the future of Washington Middle School looks like uh, with implementation of STEM by TAP as a model. We want to talk about moving forward, what this evolution in education and instruction at Washington Middle School can be like, how as a community, we wrap our arms around, arms around our families, our children, right in each other, and talk about how we support a potential transition into this new model. So I want you to keep that in mind. We're going to reiterate that throughout the evening, and we definitely want to hear from you. And we're going to talk about how that looks uh, as we move through our program. Uh, but without any further ado, I want to introduce to you our wonderful superintendent, Dr. Denise Cunot. Thank you. Thank you. I did forget. Thank you for asking the question. Um, my name is Kirk Mead. I think we should start there. My name is Kirk Mead. I am the director of stakeholder engagement, uh, the new director of stakeholder engagement for Seattle Public Schools, just as an FYI. I just wrapped up my 90th day this week, uh, so you know. Uh, and I'm excited to be serving uh, Seattle Public Schools, our students, our communities, and our families as we center them in a different way and make sure that we deliver on some meaningful promises about how we engage you, how we serve you, and how we make our children's learning the most important aspect of what we do here at Seattle Public Schools. So thank you again for coming out. And again, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Dr. Zee, did you know? Thank you, um, and thanks to all of you for turning out tonight um, in spite of the rain. Just really appreciate you being here. We've been doing a series of these with uh, different communities that are going to feed into Washington Middle School. As you all have heard, we're contemplating a uh, uh, PATH Technology Access Foundation coming to Washington Middle School um, starting next year with sixth grade and then the following year, sixth, seventh, then the following year, sixth, seventh, eighth. And what these, we started having conversations with PATH a while ago and it was really just an exciting program and curricular focus that we can bring into our system that the project-based learning focused on STEM science, technology, engineering, and math, really important things that happen for our students, project-based learning, integration of all different kinds of um, high rigor and high expectations. And that, for me, is what excited me about the opportunity for bringing TAP in. I, do, I take every opportunity when I'm in my community to talk about our strategic plan called Seattle Excellence. Um, and I'm really proud of the work that went into it. A lot of people put a lot of effort into this. When I first started being superintendent, I did a 21 stop uh, listen and learn course. All that information fed into a committee that then gathered, made up of some of our staff and community members. And actually, our community members, our community really pushed back on us to include community members on that team because uh, it made it so much better hearing from community voices, which made me a big believer in what anything we need to do has to be steeped in community. So I'm glad to see all of you again. Seattle Excellence is focused on students of color for the educational justice with an intentional focus on African American males in our system. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work around third grade reading, culturally responsive um, workforce, safe and uh, welcoming environments for our students. Those are the three initiatives we're, we're lifting this year. And when we think about high expectations, high rigor, safe, welcoming environment, culturally responsive workforce, PATH also really fits the bill for those types of efforts that we're trying to make. And so when we're out in community, we also try to make sure that we're centering the voices of communities of color as much as possible as well. Um, but I am going to hand it over to Heather from PATH, who will run through a little presentation about what is PATH um, and kind of break it down about the model that we would like to bring into TAP. There's still some moving pieces that need to happen that I can talk about the next steps with our school board and things like that. Um, and so again, we're just in a conversation right now. There's still some moving pieces that need to happen. And um, I'm just gonna turn it over to Heather to walk you through the components of that. But again, thank you all for being here. 
Good evening, as Dr. Juno said, my name is Heather. I'm Heather Lechner, the Executive Director of Education for Technology Access Foundation, or TAF. It's nice to see a number of faces in the room this evening who have attended a variety of events over the course of the past few months. So welcome back for those of you who we are in the I'm going to ask that we turn the lights down just a little bit so that we can see the screen. While that's happening, I'll just give you a little background. TAF, Technology Access Foundation, was founded in 1996. It was an out-of-school program that was really designed to create an opportunity for students of color to interface with STEM uh, industry individuals and to start to begin to develop um, skills around um, computer science and technology. When our students were going through that program, what the founder found was that when they got to high school, excuse me, when they got to college, they weren't actually prepared to go and take the classes that they needed to take in college because they didn't have the prerequisite courses. So as a result, we partnered with Federal Way Public Schools to co-run or co-manage a 6 through 12 public school that ensured that our students had access to the courses that they needed to have so that they could ultimately enter college and begin to take the rigorous course, rigorous course load and move into the careers that they were interested in. At this time, what we're talking about here tonight is the opportunity to develop a new relationship here with Seattle Public Schools. TAP wants to partner with Seattle Public Schools to create a culture of high expectations for all students. We do that through the implementation of a pedagogy that we call STEM by TAP model. And we curate content that is culturally relevant and responsive to the communities that we are entering. We enlist the community to help to enhance the instruction and to elevate the experiences of our students within the school. We want to improve opportunities for the underserved Washington Middle School students. And we want to create an academic environment that eliminates race-based disparities in academics. And we want to approach to um, support the highest level of achievement for all students in that school. Why? Because we really want to have socially conscious students who are armed with 21st century skills and have the ability to create the world in which they want to live and they envision. I'm going to talk briefly about the model. The STEM by TAP model has four pillars, and you'll notice that equity kind of runs through all of the pillars. STEM integration, which is the foundation of what TAP was built upon, <coughs> looks at incorporating opportunities and cultivating opportunities for our students to engage in STEM industry and opportunities either outside of school or within the school walls. Next, inter interdisciplinary TBL. That's really kind of the hinge pin of our model <coughs> in the school because it is the vehicle that we um, elevate for instruction. Uh, we look at teachers working across, inter across disciplines to foster projects thought of by students and created by students to, to enhance their learning. Education technology, we believe, Educational technology is an integral component as we are looking at STEM. And how we go about incorporating educational technology is really trying to keep up with the trends that are happening right now. So in our, our flagship school, TAP at the Holly, we offer coding, we offer web design, we offer virtual reality instruction, and we are moving into AI in the next semester. So really creating opportunities for students to engage with technology in a different way. And then finally, college and career readiness, creating opportunities for students to learn about uh, what possibilities exist before them. All that we do is grounded in STEM literacy. A lot of people have a notion about what STEM means. And for us, it's really about using a process or a scientific process in order to enhance uh, students' experience within the classroom. That process can exist in arts, 
that process can exist in music, that process can exist in humanity. So we're really thinking about how can they apply the skills across content. I talked a little bit about project-based learning earlier, but what we like to do is we like to offer students at least three to four opportunities to have different individual projects over the course of the year. Each of those projects are led by a core content area teacher, sometimes depending on the elective or the specialist teacher, sometimes they also drive that particular project. However, if the humanities teacher is lead, leading the project, that doesn't mean that they are doing it in isolation. So if I'm working on a project in humanities, I might do a component of it in the science class. I might work on a different component during that. Project-based learning is a cycle of learning. And instead of focusing on this particular slide, I'll move to the next one. This is a project that our sixth graders worked on last year for STEM exhibition, which is a large exhibition of learning that our students do every year. In the beginning, they begin with a problem. So the sixth graders ask, how can we improve and create natural spaces in urban environments so that they benefit people and the organisms that live in them? They had four, three different areas in which they did sustained inquiry, which is basically research, science, math, and humanities. Then we move into what we call authenticity, and that's where students were now going into the park that their school is located in and trying to find correlations between the question that they had, the research that they had done, and now putting that information together within a real world context. At that point, Students returned to the classrooms, they were grouped, and they had an opportunity to think about what, how could I solve this problem? What project could I do to come up with a creative solution? And that's where student voice and choice comes in. They begin to work on their projects, they think about um, and they research, they incorporate the research, and then once they have an initial project, they actually work with each other and they begin to go through a cycle of critique and revision. Something that's really important in this whole process is public presentation. So our students then, once they've created whatever their product is, in this instance, they made models. Um, and they presented those models in this exhibition of learning. Uh, along this way, there are potential opportunities for partnership with industry and community. So we have people from the uh, community who work in parks and recreation, who work with conservation, come in and provide feedback on students' plans, ideas, and also their final projects. I think this is, an, uh, before we get into implementation, uh, we start off the whole process with what we call jumpstart, and so this is just a two minute video.
video because Jumpstart is a very important part of the onboarding for uh, elementary students who are coming into our middle school environment. One, it helps them to begin to build that community that's so important um, in order for our school to be successful, for it to be welcoming, for our project to be successful, and really for students to feel like they are at home within our school. Um, and also for them to get a taste of what is going to be implemented over the course of their time in the school in terms of industry people coming in to help support and amplify their learning. At the same time, we put kids all in there because we believe in the whole child. There's got to be time for play as well as direct instruction. And so we try to find the balance in the summer as we bring kids on. I know a number of people really are interested in terms of our class setup, and so I wanted to talk through um, what we envision for the school. Um, we operate in houses. Um, they are generally about 25 to 28 students in a class, and each house is comprised of three classes. There is a science teacher, a humanities teacher, and a math teacher. Um, we like to loop, but again, we respond to the communities that we are in, so if that is not the desire of the teaching community, that's a conversation that can be had. We're committed to providing at least one high school certified math teacher to support advanced learners in the houses that require that. And um, just a note that humanities teachers have to be certified in English and social studies because they cover both together. Oh, I apologize. Thank you so much. So loop means if um, I am in sixth grade and I had these three teachers in the house when I go to seventh grade, I could potentially have the same three teachers in seventh grade supporting the students. Thank you so much. Uh, proposed courses, um, all grades get math, humanities, science. A number of people have asked about electives. Um, are we interested in dismantling music? Absolutely not. Uh, we often uh, at TAF talk about being supplemental, not supplanting anything. So what is working? Um, Elective-wise at the school will continue, but our hope would be to add courses that don't potentially exist there, like engineering, robotics. Um, for the upper level eighth graders, there's some regulations around VR, and we're really mindful about that. So if you're over 12, you might be able to engage in it. If you're not, then we won't be able to bring that particular resource. 
the other thing that we, as TAC, when we look at partnership, part of that partnership is people. There are a number of people who would come into the school building to help support the implementation of this model because we recognize that, um, that it is a learning curve for students as well as for teachers. Uh, the two most important people on this list I'm going to highlight are the instructional coaches and the student support specialists. The instruct instructional coach is on site daily. They are there to help the teachers to develop the skills and strategies that are necessary to implement PDL. They help to create connections to community or to uh, facilitate experiences for students inside, outside of the building. Student support specialists, I know there's a number of people who have articulated concerns around math, and so I'm gonna linger here just a little bit. Um, our math classes, if we're on a four period day, our math classes are 90 minute blocks. Uh, we have committed with the district to not have more than two, what we call preps, content preps, per period. And what that means is that if there is a sixth grader in the sixth grade class, that's doing sixth grade math, there will be a group that is doing that level. Um, and if there are within that same class students who are on eighth grade math, they will have the opportunity to be in that same class, get credit for eighth grade math, and have the amount of minutes that they need to actually get the credit for that class. Okay? Most courses are about 45 minutes, and so that's what's 45 to 52 minutes, so a day. So the students will still get the time that they need in order to be able to get the credit for that class at the level they're in. Um, to help facilitate that process, we have student support specialists that is an additional person in each math class to help with uh, the execution and support of instruction during that time. There are a number of opportunities. I won't read this long list to you, but um, we've kind of explored them over the course of the, the session, but um, and then staffing. I know there are a number of families who have really strong relationships with the teachers in Washington Middle School, and it is not our intention to replace or remove any of the teachers who were there. So I really want to stress that the principal will remain, the teachers will remain. Our job is to provide professional development to the teachers so that they can implement the skills and strategies necessary in order to um, fully implement the STEM by TAF model. All other staff will remain as well, unless they make a decision, different decision for themselves. If you want to learn more about TAF, this is our information. Please uh, look, up, look us up. I know a number of you have already had. Um, it's my pleasure to have just been able to share this information with you tonight, and I am going to turn it over. Thank you. I appreciate it. Can we bring the lights back up real quick? We'll bring the lights back up, and then we'll... Okay, good. Thank you so much for getting those lights. So, uh, what we're going to do next uh, is spend a little bit of time with each other. And I first want to identify a few people in the room so that you get a sense of who's here. Um, who you can talk to, who your resources are in this conversation this evening. And then I want you to be able to spend some time talking and discussing amongst yourselves about how we move the program and the conversation forward at the Washington Middle School. So uh, if you are on our school board, uh, I would love for you to raise our hand. I know we have Director Hansen and Director Matt. Uh, thank you so much. Well, if Christy, oh, thank you. First, thank you so very much. Um, Reckon. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, if you give them a round of applause, I want you to appreciate them for their service here. Thank you so much. Uh, I know we've got several directors who are very deeply um, committed to family and community engagement, and I appreciate their energy and enthusiasm this evening. Um, I'd also like to point out our, our admin staff. I think we have Dean Barry, who's here as well. Um, we've also got Dr. Uh, Dr. Juneau, Dr. Keisha Scarlett, uh, who's also in the building for you as well, in the back. So I want to point out that you have uh, lots of folks in the room here um, who are, again, are available for you to talk with. Uh, I also want to make certain that you, you all got a colored dot this evening. Did everyone get a colored dot this evening? That's going to be important for our next, uh, our next visit. Did anyone not get a colored dot? All right. 
Uh, if we can make certain everyone gets a colored dot, and I'm going to tell you what we're going to do next. So we're going to break down into groups. And we're going to have some prompts for our groups, but we're first going to break out. And the way those groups are going to be broken out is by your colored dot. So uh, we have a red group, a green group, blue, yellow, um, and I think we've got red again, but we're going to go with uh, red, green, uh, blue, and yellow as for the dots. So if you have those dots, those are the groups that you're going to be in. All right? So make sure everybody gets a dot. And the tables are color coded as well. If you look on the table, each table has a color. So, um, over the next five minutes, I'm going to ask you all, once you, everyone gets their color, give it a couple more seconds here. Once everyone gets their color, I would love for you to take a moment and move to your table. We're going to get you some stationery, some markers, and we're going to give you a prompt to engage with each other about some of the next steps. So, if you wouldn't mind. Excuse me, excuse me, sir. Yes. I, yeah, yes, go ahead. I have a yes, ma'am. There's a lot of people here in this room, and I know that I went to the uh, Indonesian Media on Tuesday. Yes, ma'am. At the end of the gap, we did not do this kind of exercise. Okay. Okay, so that's first and foremost. I know that there are a lot of people in this room that have all kinds of questions. Yes. And I would like to hear everybody's question that you asked. Okay. I do not want to go to that.
Thank you so much. So we're going to move into uh, our general Q&A session, okay? Um, who would like to start with question and answer? Oh, yeah, just raise your hand and tell us what you see. Oh, okay, fantastic. Question. I may have another mic for you. Oh, great. What's going to happen to the existing programs in Washington? So, for those of you, for those of you that may not have heard, the question was, what will happen to the existing uh, programs at Washington Middle School? Uh, so, for our past, who would like to answer that question? Thank you. Sir. I guess the existing programs, as is, I mean, TAP is a way of teaching. It's not a curriculum, right? So. Curriculum will still be ascribed to all the standards that the district has will still be met. It's just that the idea that PAP is coming in, it's a type, it's a way of teaching. It's a different pedagogy for teachers, it's a way of instruction. And so the programs or the curriculum will still stay in place. As you heard, band will still be there. The electives that uh, are high interest will remain. Um, math, I know there's a lot of questions about math. Your sixth grader, if they are in eighth grade math, will get eighth grade math. There is a high school accredited uh, teacher assigned to every house. And so math will still be taught to the level that's needed to be taught wherever the student is. Um, so as far as, do you have a specific program you're asking about? Uh, HCC. Okay, so it will still remain an HC pathway. What we're talking about is what we're asking the board to do is no longer have the cohort because PATH and the project-based learning and the pedagogy that comes with it does not um, come in where there are separate programs. And so there will still be highly capable pathway, highly capable services will still be provided, but it will be in a blended model. Is, is your intention to implement this district-wide or just here in the South End? Just at Washington Middle School for next year in sixth grade. So no plans to affect the North End? Not at this point because we're talking about one specific school and bringing a program into this school. We did have some other ideas about the entire cohort program that we brought to the um, board and that conversation continues. So we have another question over here and I want to also offer that as a really important fact here, we want to make sure we center some of our... So I want to make sure we, we spend some time also centering our families first of from educational justice. So our families of color, families who are generally marginalized in our educational process. That's, that's the thing that we're talking about at the, at the school district. We want to make certain that we do that at each one of our convenings. So just, I want you to be aware of who's in the room. And as we talk about that, I will be emphasizing and spending some time trying to make sure we get our families of color engaged in this conversation as well, okay? Um, so I have someone over here, and I'm going to move quickly around this way, kind of clockwise to the hand. So it'll pop back up next, right? I'm headed your way. Excellent. Okay, so um, I just wanted clarification on the math because you said that they'll spend a certain number of minutes on the eighth grade math. So what are they going to be spending the other minutes? I'm a little confused. Um, the reason that we know. The, the Did everybody hear the question? Hang on a second. Did everyone get the question? And, all right. Fantastic. Thank you. Instruction will continue during that time, but there are components of the class that are direct instruction. There are components of the class that are indiv individual group, project focused. And so what I'm saying is that, um, that they will not be at a lack of minutes for their particular content within that course, within that 90 minute time period. Correct. Oh, that's Thank you. And additionally, like I said, there's an additional person in the classroom that can help to facilitate if there's group work going on or individual work going on or they're working on a project. All right, we have a question over here in the corner. I would just um, to reassure you, Lachai Elementary has been differentiating like that for years. And I think with the professional development, if you could be really excited about the to continue that with the multi-level in the same classroom, and it is really possible with, if the teachers get support. My next question is, um, is about the cohort model. Um, I was able to read something, um, and I feel like it would be helpful for clarification for the HCC parents, because I'm hearing from a lot of parents who I know that they're, you know, the sense that 
that this district is dismantling the HCC program. And the way I read the document, I'm not sure what the title of it was, but um, the pathway is still gonna be to Washington. So I, it may be a misnomer to say that you're getting rid of the cohort program. Um, you're just creating a blended program. So there's still gonna be a critical mass of students at Washington. Um, so I think this is actually a really incredible opportunity that maybe a lot of people haven't had the opportunity to really understand. But so you're not sending all the HCC kids back to their neighborhood school where it would be very difficult to give professional development and differentiation to every teacher in the Southeast area at once. Like that would be, I think, a bad decision. But if students are still, who qualify for HCC service, I'm sorry, you're looking at me like, you don't. Know. Is that your question? So, I, I, feel like, I, I feel like it's a really important clarification from the conversation I'm hearing of parents. So I guess I wanted, I did want a question, which is, is that the plan, is that the plan to really all, all the HCC students would continue going to Washington, they will not be sent back to their neighborhood schools. I think that's just a really big fear that people have. That would be important to clarify. Thank you. I'm sorry it took me a while, but. Um, uh, first, of, first of all, my name is Sherry Cox, and I'm a senior advisor uh, to the superintendent here in Seattle Public Schools, and I've uh, been working probably uh, most in depth with the TAF, uh, my partners from TAF, or my hopeful partners from TAF, and so uh, thank you for that question. And the answer is yes, the pathway will remain at Washington for the folks whose pathway is to Washington for the cohort. So uh, we are then, um, so yes, there will still be critical mass or have whatever term you want to use to define the number of students qualified for highly capable services going to Washington Middle School. We are not stopping services. We are required by federal law, by state law, I think actually, to provide highly capable services. So we will continue to provide highly capable services to students who need highly capable services in a general ed blended model. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I, I'm seeing the hands. Make certain that after the next question is asked, you pop your hands up. I'm just moving with the pattern of the hands, okay? Just so you know. So I'm not trying to ignore you. I'm just going to move the pattern of the hands. You have a question over here. Uh, I have a question about how it'll work when the HCC kids and the other kids come together. What are the qualifications for the teachers to work with that? I know you said you have smaller class sizes, and I thought. The TAF model had more of a 20 to 21 student model, but tonight we heard a 25 to 28, so I think we've heard different things around class sizes. And we've also heard that the teachers will go through like a 24 hour training um, for the TAF model. What are the TAF teachers and other teachers doing for certification or for teachers to work with the HCC children who have some needs? Thank you for that question. So, uh, first of all, our most of our middle school, there is no um, highly capable certification for the middle school's uh, teacher. So, um, but TAF and our sixth grade teachers at Washington Middle School next year would go through a four-day training um, on the TAF instructional model, so the STEM by TAF instructional model, which in their current uh, schools and in their trainings, they serve students who need special education services all the way through um, students who need highly capable services in the schools that they're currently in. And so that is part of their training on how to differentiate instruction in the classroom, how to accelerate if needed, how to do compacting if needed. There's a variety of services that can be utilized in a general education setting to serve the diverse needs of a student, the students before them. So to answer your class size question, so um, when we originally calculated the dollars required, because this is a partnership where TAP is putting in dollars and the SPS is adding additional dollars to Washington Middle School as well. Part of those dollars come from for the training and the other part of the dollars come for staffing. So uh, we did our initial calculations after talking with TAP for a one to 25 teacher student ratio. But in the math classes, there is an additional staff in the room to help with meeting the needs of, for example, a group of students who need sixth grade math, 
and a student tuned down to one, if that's how the classes were divided. The other beautiful thing that comes with TAP uh, that I think you heard Heather talk a little bit about is the coach that's at the school. So while the teacher's 24 hours doesn't sound like a lot of training, I will say that's a, that in the teacher world, that's a fair amount of training. Unfortunately, we wish they got more, but they don't. Um, but the beautiful thing about having a coach in the building with them is that if I'm doing a lesson and I'm not quite sure about it as the teacher, I can ask the coach to come in alongside me and uh, we can teach the lesson together maybe, or we can, um, the coach can give me some feedback on how to do the, the lesson better the next time I do it or the next period I do it. And so there's the 24 hours of training right up front, and then there is the ongoing professional coaching throughout the school year. Great. All right, so um, I want to make certain I get your question. I also want to make certain, are there any general education questions? Uh, we want to cover that as well. we got 15 minutes, definitely want to get a balance of questions. So any additional general ed questions, or any first time general ed questions that we want to cover? So how many are in? So one, two, Sort of, kind of. So we're going to prioritize general ed questions next after this this question. So pop your hands up real quick for general ed questions, and I will make, I will move to you quickly. Thank you. My maybe good transition doesn't apply to either one in particular. Uh, just for the TAP team, uh, could you talk a little bit about the qualifications that TAP or non public school? Is Sawali the only experience running the public school? Are there others? Uh, how long is the running the middle school? How long is the running the high school? And then are both uh, uh, choice schools or are they assignment schools? Uh, so that's not what you say. So first I'll say that we don't run anything. We partner. Okay? And I think that's a really important distinction. We're not a charter school. We, we are not an independent program. We are partners in this work and we're committed to traditional district schools. So I think that's really important to understand. Secondly, um, when we started TAP Academy, TAP Academy was a standalone school that existed for seven years. And because of the success of that school, we were asked to merge with Sahali Middle School. And that happened about two and a half years ago. At this point, we are TAP at Sahali, and we co-manage that school. We work in partnership with the district. The middle school is the feeder school, I mean, the, the natural path for the community. So. Um, the students who come to the middle school are assigned to that middle school. The students who choose to stay in our high school, they choice in. The rest continue on the path to Decatur. They have a choice whether or not they return. So since we have joined TAP at Sahali um, in this past year, we had a full 25 students who decided to stay and choice into our high school. Those students want to have a more intimate experience. They don't want the big $2,000, not $2,000, $2,000 student comprehensive experience. They appreciate the relationships and the, that they can't get lost. Right. And as far as, do you have another question? I have a question. Well, we only have 75 slots. So um, there's a waiting. We've got another. I'm sure, you're gonna follow up with that. Or? Okay. So we have a uh, question over here. A general ed question over here. I have a question. So it's a blended model, my understanding. I'm not hearing how you're planning to serve the kids of color who are below grade level. Um, it's, it's my understanding there's a large gap. That exists, but I'm not quite understanding how TAP is going to address that gap for kids who are below grade level math, reading, and English and science. Can you speak to that? Um, first and foremost, again, since we're a partner, we work with and we really supplant and enhance what's there. So we are working with the teachers who are in the building, and we trust that the teachers are professionals and that they will be able to provide quality instruction to the students. What we do is we help to create a culture that um, creates a more, I would say, interactive sort of learning environment that centers student voice and choice. Rarely are you going to enter in one of our classrooms and see a whole class where students are sitting down, where they're working on worksheets, where they're just reading from a book for the entire time. And so 
as a result, students are asked to collaborate. They're asked to be critical thinkers, problem solvers, to generate questions and help each other find solutions. And I think that's a very different learning sort of environment, and it reaches a variety of learners. Um, one of the things that I did before I came here, I was a director of special services, so I worked with a variety of spaces where students were in a variety of levels, and, and whether they were special needs students or general ed students, when there was a gap, I found that most often when an environment was highly engaging, students were able to lock in, find something that was interesting, and really elevate their learning. And we have an expectation of high expectations for all of our students, and so as a result, we create an environment which is conducive to the learning Thank you, it's over here to your right here. We got a question, David? Uh, I understand that the executive committee of the district school board met last night to discuss TAP and vote, and I'm wondering what was that about, what was the outcome of the vote, and then what does that suggest for the next steps in this process? Great, thank you for that question. Uh, she asked for next steps. Um, so last night the executive committee of the whole met, and the question also was what does that mean? So last night the entire board came together to learn uh, more about TAP, uh, the joint operating agreement draft was re was part of the conversations as well as a pretty deep dive into uh, two things. One is data and two is um, how uh, we will continue to provide uh, highly capable services in a blended model. So um, the only three people that took vote to determine if this work moves to the next step are the three uh, members of the executive committee, uh, President DeWolf, Vice President Hansen, and member at large, um, Director Harris. Those three voted unanimously to move all of this work out of committee and into the full board for uh, consideration on January 8th. So on January 8th, uh, the board will uh, hear again, um, not the exact same presentation, but some, some of the similar information so that it is, um, broadcast for people uh, to hear uh, who weren't there last night and then um, they will ask questions um, kind of the similar process that happens when a bar is brought a board action report is brought to them um, the next step if all goes kind of as typical would be for um, the board to take action on january 22nd and the reason for the timing of that is important because we want you all to have the information to make choices before our open enrollment period starts on February 3rd. So that's the, what happened and what's coming next. Well, that actually, I have a question. You know, hold on, for just one second. Okay. Oh. I, I want to make certain that sure. we've got it. So you're, you're okay? Okay, let me get the mic so we can hear. Yeah. So at this time, under current policy, and, and I want to just restate, under current policy, all, all of our HC families have two choices, which is one more choice than anybody else in the district has. They can choose to go to their attendance area school, or they can choose to go to the highly capable pathway. What if it's the same? Then you have one choice. So um, with that, we have not, we are not proposing to make any changes to that current policy. So at this time, we're not making any changes, or we're not, the district, central office staff is not proposing any changes to that 
Every family in Seattle Public Schools can go through the school choice process. There's just no guarantees, and it depends on capacity of buildings. Right. So I hope that answers your well, question. Well, it does answer my question on, on, on one hand, but how we ended up here at Thurgood Marshall as my family is, you know, we, we did want to stay in our, in our neighborhood school when my son tested into MHC. And we were told that he was not going to be able to get that. He was not going to be able to get the two years ahead in math at his neighborhood school, even though, even though the district, if you, if you went to the website at the time, it told you that, you know, every school, that the ALO, the advanced learning opportunities, that they would, you know, children who were in advanced learning or who were in HC, they would be able to get these services. It turns out that was not in fact true. So there's that. And so forgive me if, if I don't have a whole lot of trust in, in what the district is saying around that and also around just the whole mishandling of the, of the communication around how this has been rolled out, how, how it has been implemented, how people have found out about it. I found out about all of this happening in the Seattle Times. Nobody from Thurgood Marshall or the district told me anything about, about these proposed changes to Washington Middle School. And I would also like to say too that I have never had a conversation with anybody at a higher district level as a black parent of a child who is in HC. Nobody has ever convened, as far as I know, any, any meetings with us to talk about our concerns, to talk about um, our experiences, whether it's in the HC, whether it's here at Thurgood Marshall, whether it's in our neighborhood school, nobody has ever come to talk to us about our experiences. And so I just want to I just want to put that out there. You know, I mean, I you know, Superintendent Junior, I see you nodding your head, but you can make that happen. You can you can make that happen. The other board members who are in this room, you can make that happen. So it's not enough for me to have folks nodding your, you know, nodding your head. Because I want to just remind everybody here that yes, my, my, my boy, my son is in HC, but he still sits at the intersection of all of the same things in this country that have children like Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice being killed. He still sits at that intersection, even though he is in HC. And so I just feel like the voices of, of HC parents of color, but also really, I think when you look up north, you see that they do have a robust HC program. They do have robust general education services. Why aren't we getting that also in the South End? Why is it always in the South End? It's like this either or. This has been very divisive and this has been very painful. And I feel like it's really hitting the South End and the North End goes on scale. What the end? is 
going to do that. Um, regarding providing highly capable services in our uh, all of our schools, you are absolutely right. We have um, we have historically uh, qualified students and said, "I can't serve you. Go over to that school." And we've honestly we've let our teachers. Uh, and our school leaders and ourselves off the hook to providing the services that every single student needs in their attendance area school. We are committed to work with our teachers union who is committed to doing the work alongside of us uh, and at a place in our teaching uh, professional practices where we're ready, um, they are ready, and they are committed to serving students across the, need, the needs, uh, academic needs, social emotional needs in the attendance area of schools. I don't, uh, I never, the, the geography question. That's a big question. I don't, I, I don't have the answer to that question here today. It's an important question um, and I can certainly uh, work with the teams in central office to think through um, what this means. Uh, the advanced learning task force question, um, that team, the recommendations were posted on the advanced uh, learning task force website today. Uh, Superintendent Juno will dig into those with staff to determine what, if any, changes uh, she would like to propose to the, uh, for the school board to make regarding how we are um, sending kids into a cohort model. Are we going to continue with that? Do we want to maybe take a look at doing differently uh, and providing services to students in neighborhood schools or somewhere in between? So I don't, I don't know that I get most, and I'm happy to have a conversation um, with you uh, to try to get a better understanding if I miss something. I, I know we are, we're coming up on time, so I want to get at least two more questions. I want to be one of our families who are first from education justice, and I want them to be general ed questions as well. I want to make sure we get that in. So any general ed questions, let's see, one hand there. Anyone else? Anyone in here? So we're gonna go with two. Um, we got the two, one here, and in the back. So I'll end with the mic. Thank you so much. So I have a general ed question. Yes, my child is in HCC as well. I have had my voice heard to the extent it was also ignored. I had the opportunity to be a part of the ATLF. And my concern and my question is, what I felt like was not heard was a need for the community itself to change in order to impact our kids in their educational justice. I have I also took the opportunity to go to TAF as part of my job for the industry today. Industry. Can you hold the microphone closer? Yeah. Um, and was impressed by what I saw. I can say I didn't look at the school from the standpoint of being a parent whose kid was going to attend a school that was similar. But as a parent who took part of the ATLF, and understood the different needs of different children, uh, from those that had special ed to those that needed advanced learning and all those in between. From those that were uh, furthest away from educational justice to those who have experienced privilege. I watched kids help each other, work together in teams, I saw the, the teachers, the aides, and specialists as I had an opportunity to actually attempt to teach, share how to use a particular tool that was going to help them with their projects. And it was amazing to watch it all manifest in front of myself, frankly. To see the teachers and the assistants helping someone like myself, who is not a teacher, to be able to successfully reach all of the kids. But my question still stands, how are we going to engage the community? How do we even, if we bring TAP to one school in the South End, 
And let's say it's successful. Keep the gentrification from happening. Keep in the privilege from happening with that one soul. That is my biggest concern and question about having such a pilot at one school. And that wasn't even my question with the ATLF to present or propose or recommend a pilot at one school when we have such division in our communities. Thank you for that question. Um, so, and thank you for sharing what you observed as a as an observer at Cap Academy. Um, the question about the gentrification is that we as a school district, we see it happening and, and we, we can't change what's happening in the city as much as we would like to. However, I will say that we are committed and TAF as our partner and is gonna hold us to this, that um, we serve uh, students in the attendance area and where we've been good at that in Seattle Public Schools um, is, is actually at Cleveland High School. And Cleveland STEM uh, was created to, for, to create a high school for STEM programming for uh, our students for this from educational justice in that south, south end of the city. We've had schools try. Um, we've had schools that do not represent the racial makeup of the Cleveland service area try to get in as a pathway because they're also a STEM school and we've said no, no. That's great that you're a STEM school but you're not getting a, a, a pathway into Cleveland High School. We set that up intentionally to serve students that live in the southeast area of Seattle. So that was our commitment around Cleveland and we're committed to holding the attendance area uh, model at Washington Middle School. So I don't know if that fully answers it. Um, and yes, we have a lot of healing to do as a community. We, as central office staff, have some healing to do with our stakeholders, the teachers at Washington Middle School. Um, and we're committed uh, that if our school board moves forward with uh, TAP, we're committed to doing that work. Um, with all of you. I mean, we're committed to the healing to do better by communication and, and engaging you, but as it pertains to TAP, we're committed to doing that work alongside you. Okay, so we have we have one last question in the back here. So this is the last question for the evening and then we will wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Mike Smith. And my question is kind of a follow-up that was kind of already stated because my biggest concern in this dialogue is really how we are serving um, the majority of the gen ed and the majority of the uh, students of color who do not have at current access to HCC through systemic barriers and systemic issues that are historical. I want to comment about trust that um, I think it's unfortunate that Seattle Public Schools is, uh, the gap is widening for trust for other families, but I want to say, unfortunately, welcome to the world of black families. Welcome to the world of Native American families. Welcome to the world of Latinx families for our privileged HCC families who don't understand what that world is like. Welcome. Um, and let's work together to push forward so that this is not an issue for anybody or any family in this district. So my question is, following up around um, This, how TAF, which I support 100% because I have a history with TAF myself for my daughter who's a grown adult, and I've seen the work, and I've had students and families that I know from their other programs, I've seen the success. So I don't have much doubt about their credibility and what they can bring to Seattle Public Schools. And unfortunately, I'm happy that we're fortunate enough now to have an opportunity. But with that question around gentrification, Right, and all these programs that happen in Seattle, and as our families who are furthest from education are going out, this is the residential school area. Has it already been discussed that when success is proven, that this could be opened up at another another school? Because South End District Seven suffers, and as much as I want to see the success here for all the students and the Gen Ed students and the HCC students, 
it's still going to be a barrier for, for my children. It's still going to be a barrier for the other students. And these are the kids who are trapped in the prison, uh, the prison pipeline. So is there, is there a pathway already set there? And then when I say again about the trust for the families that are here, fortunately being the historical black central area where our kids have been underserved for so long, and got, please be uh, mindful and humble of how you have this conversation in these spaces about your situations for our kids and I, just please be humble and respectful to, um, in your experience to understand that even in your experience, you're still stepping and spitting on our experience and our fight for the longest. And think about the history of ACC even coming into the Central District in that whole integration conversa conversation of why people are here anyways to isolate their children from being blended with our black families anyways, to being blended with our genius, period. So please, just be gentle when you have that conversation and when you, and, and when you include, include that in the conversations about communities of color, particularly black folks, I'm just asking to have, I understand your fight for your children and I, and I will fight for mine as well. But please just, in order to have some solidarity, have some respect in the, in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Amaja. And to answer your question, um, at this time we're only talking about Washington Middle School, but we are certainly not opposed if this is, uh, if this knocks it out of the park, which we think it will over the course of time, um, uh, this superintendent is interest, would be interested in continuing talks, and I see Taft as our partner would be interested in continuing talks to bring it about to other uh, schools in the district. So. Yes, we would definitely be interested in furthering conversations. All right. Test. All right, so with that, I want to wrap up this evening. I want to make certain that you're aware we have our district leadership teams, we have school board members in the room. I, just as a, as, if you could just raise your hand quickly if you are you're affiliated, associated with the district, or on our school board, raise your hand, please. So uh, we've got folks in the room. Um, we have folks who we can talk to directly. And we're here for that. So I want to make certain that is uh, something that, I, that we acknowledge. Uh, we're at time. So again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming out in the rain. Thank you for your traffic. Drive home safely. Thank you. <laughs>